Welcome, good evening, and thank you for joining us in the latest installment of the Autistic Women and Nonbinary Networks Liberating Webinars series. My name is Lydia XZ Brown, sign name L Brown, pronouns they, them, and I am AW1's Director of Policy, Advocacy, and External Affairs. Today, I'm wearing a shirt that has artwork by Micah Bazant, B-A-Z-A-N-T. And it shows two trans women of color and says, remember trans power, fight for trans lives. Just a couple of notes on access. You should be able to access captioning by clicking the button at the bottom for a live transcript and show subtitle. You were then able to drag the captions around the screen as you prefer. You can also open the transcript and in full on the sidebar. If you are seeing a box pop up that is covering your view of the captions or the interpreters that tells you captioning is available, then you can actually click the little X at the corner of that box to close it. And then you should be able to drag the captioning around the screen or hide it if it is not useful to you. You can also access this, the captioning through stream text by opening a separate window. Tonight, we will be discussing changing media perceptions of disability. And I'm really excited to introduce to you our three guests. First, we have Dominic Evans, a trans, queer, crip, director and writer, consultant, Twitch streamer, and dad. They have a BFA in film. Dominic's work delves into inclusion in media, sex education for disabled and LGBTQIA youth, marriage equality, institutional bias, and reproductive rights. In 2014, he founded hashtag film dis, a Twitter chat about disability in media. Dominic has spoken around the world. He recently directed the music video Spaces from his home in Michigan and works in Hollywood, consulting studios to make the industry more inclusive. Dominic spends a lot of time streaming on Twitch, exploring accessibility and access. With their partner, Ashton, they release an annual study into disability on television. Next, I'd like to introduce Kristen Lopez, currently the TV editor of Indie Wire. She has been writing on popular culture with an emphasis on disability representation for 15 years, with her work published at Variety, MTV, Roger Ebert, and Forbes. In her free time, she enjoys classic film and podcasting with her friends at Ticklish Business, which is a great business name. And last, but definitely not least, we have AJ Link, who is openly autistic. He received his JD from the George Washington University Law School. AJ is currently pursuing an LLM Master of Laws in Space Law at the University of Mississippi School of Law, while also serving as the inaugural director of the Center for Air and Space Law Task Force on Inclusion, Diversity, and Equity in Aerospace. He works as a research director for the Juice Ad Adstra Project and serves as president and executive director of the National Disabled Law Students Association which he co-founded. AJ was awarded the Michael Dillon Cooley Memorial Award by his graduating class for his compassion and humility in serving his fellow students and was inducted into the Susan M. Daniels Disability Mentoring Hall of Fame. So to kick us off, I'd like to ask each of you if you could talk a little bit more about what you do that's not captured in your bios and how your work addresses 
changing media perceptions of disability. And I'll go to Kristen to kick us off. Sure. I mean, a lot of what I write, obviously, is about disability in in entertainment. Um, But I also think that just the concept of me being a entertainment writer is kind of, I think the word revolutionary is far too, far too bombastic, but is changing perceptions of what disabled people can do. I'm a wheelchair user. And, you know, I think a lot of people in the entertainment industry have never met a disabled person, let alone a disabled journalist. You know, I know that when I was growing up, I didn't think journalism was a job that I could do. I'd never seen a wheelchair user uh, as a journalist. And so a lot of what I do outside of my writing is lovingly forcing people to confront the fact that a lot of the spaces that I inhabit to do my job have accessibility issues. So I think outside of just my day-to-day writing, just me being in the position that I'm in is hopefully causing other journalists to be like, hey, why aren't there more disabled journalists in entertainment in the field at all? So I, I, I would like to hope that that's how I'm expanding it out beyond just my day job. Thanks so much for sharing that, Kristen. And I was really excited when we were introduced uh, to talk about you participating on this panel because there truly are not enough openly disabled people working in journalism. There are a lot of us trying to influence journalism and not enough of us that are actually there. Um, so thank you for joining us. Um, AJ, I'll turn to you next. Hey all, thanks for having me. This is AJ speaking. Um, I'm a black dude with a beard. My pronouns are he, him. I have on a salmonish shirt that says feminist. And there's a gallery wall behind me that was done by my lovely partner. Um, I, I don't work necessarily in entertainment media, but my work with the National Disabled Law Students Association and broader disability advocacy is about changing the perception of what disabled folks and the legal community look like. Um, there are some really famous autistic folks doing legal work, um, Lydia among them, um, people like Haley Moss, uh, but showing that disability can look and act and, and be all different types of things in the legal community and the legal profession and kind of reframing, um, I guess, the common notions of what being a disabled attorney or a disabled legal advocate um, looks like, acts like, and does, um, and especially um, not, not um, limiting them to just doing disability law and disability advocacy, but showing that they are, in fact, whole people with decision-making power and agency. Um, And and that's kind of the perceptions that I work in and fight against. Thank you so much, AJ. Um, I really admire your work with Indalsa and especially your advocacy to fight against really ableist and awful policies that law schools and other universities have been trying to impose on disabled folks. And hopefully you'll have a chance to talk about that in a few minutes. Uh, But next I will turn to Dominic. Hey everyone. Um, so as Lydia said, I'm non-binary. I am a white person. My shirt is black and it says protect trans kids on it. Um, and I am laying down in my bed because I, and you can see my wheelchair in the background because it's more comfortable for me to lay down when I'm doing these kinds of panels and whatnot. So uh, I would say a few years ago, I just started showing up in bed to kind of, as kind of a protest and kind of, I, I see everything I do video oriented as a part of media when I'm doing things like this. So representing that it's okay to do things from bed and that you can do things from bed effectively is a part of changing perception. So kind of everything I do in my own life is working towards this idea of changing media perceptions too. Um, I think that a lot of people misunderstand who I am just from looking at me, part of, part of that being as, you know, I'm trans, but a lot of people think that I am a trans man when I'm non-binary because I look a bit more masculine um, 
testosterone kind of made me go the other extreme. I used to be very feminine um, in, in appearance and had a very high voice. And then my transition went the other way. So I think when people look at me, there are all kinds of misconceptions. Um, I am multiply disabled. I have a physical disability that requires a wheelchair to get around. People always assume it's my only disability, but I'm also um, psychosocially disabled. I have ADHD that went undiagnosed for a long time, which made me fall through a lot of cracks everywhere from school to just social situations. Um, and I have um, various mental health diagnoses, OCD. Um, I have PTSD. I have anxiety and I have chronic health disabilities. So I live in multiple realms where I see misrepresentation. As someone multiply disabled, I, I see the representation of multiple disabilities erased everywhere, um, especially in the media. As, I, as Lydia mentioned, uh, my partner Ashton and I, who is also disabled, although people don't identify her as disabled because she's chronically disabled and also has anxiety. Um, they don't recognize her as disabled either. So her identity is often erased. And that has really kind of moved our work in our study to where we, um, we know a lot about how these perceptions are and we see how they impact how disabled people are treated in the real world, in real world situations. And all of our work has kind of been about trying to change those perceptions because that will work towards the treatment of disabled people being changed as well. A lot of our mistreatment comes from lack of understanding that the media could rectify. Um, I directed the, the video spaces from my bed and it was very important for me to make that a hallmark of the representation. I saw the media try to spin that as, oh, it's so inspiring, where my message, um, I fought very hard to turn that around to be, no, this is just acceptable and we are as productive or even more productive in these settings. So even within our stories, when we do get in the media, I see that we are they're twisting our narratives about what's going on. So that's very important to the work I do. Um, right now I've been working on television scripts and that's where it's going. I've been consulting, but the next step is actually getting into the room because I believe that we're not gonna see better perceptions if disabled people are not leading the narratives. So I can tell Hollywood all I want, hire disabled people, hire disabled people, hire disabled people. But if they're not gonna do it, then you know the next step is disabled people saying, we're creating, let us in the door. So that, that's where my work is and, and that's the expanded uh, version of my bio. This is Lydia. I'm just so frustrated, right, by the expectation of tokenism and that even when we are allowed, quote unquote, through the door or at the table, we're still expected to fit very narrow narratives of what disabled people's lives are like, of what it means to be disabled, and of how disability should be talked about, whether in documentary or news coverage or whether in popular medium, TV or video games or novels or what have you. Uh, but one thing that I know is on my mind and on a lot of people's minds right now has been the coverage of disability and chronic illness and mental health as related to the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. And one concern that I've had and I know is shared by many other disabled folks are narratives floating around that COVID-19 really isn't that bad because on the one hand, it only quote unquote is really a problem for some disabled people. And on the other hand, that COVID-19 should be scary because 
it might cause you to become disabled. So two very different types of ableist narrative. And I'm wondering how you've all experienced recent coverage and public narratives around disability, mental health, and COVID. And I'll go back to AJ, if you would comment on that first. Yeah, this is AJ speaking. Lydia did a good job of kind of summarizing what's going on. It's really just ableism and people just not giving a fuck about disabled people. I think you described disabilophobia really well, where it's, you know, the fear of disability, um, whether it's disabled people having to interact with disabled folks or even, you know, potentially becoming disabled and people thinking that's the worst thing ever. And, you know, um, I, I couldn't survive if I was disabled and, you know, just like that, that deep rooted systemic ableism. And it's kind of just like, um, disabled folks and immunocompromised folks are left on their own, you know, just, um, don't go outside, you know, if, if you're sick, if you're scared, stay home. And it's like, you know, we live in, in a horrible capitalist society that that's full of racism, ableism, ageism, you know, sexism, misogyny. And it's like, um, it shouldn't be that difficult to actually care about other folks. And I think something that I've seen is that a lot of disabled voices are concentrated in disabled spaces and disabled advocacy networks, um, disability Twitter, things like that. But the larger narrative is just like, oh yeah, disabled folks exist, you know, whatever. Um, you know, if you get COVID, you'll be fine, whatever. It's a small percentage. Um, it's not that bad. And it's uh, it's incredibly frustrating. And you talked, you touched on mental health. And, you know, I think over the past couple of years, mental health and self-care have kind of been commodified to a sickening extent. Uh, and we have to understand that while there are um, psychiatric disabilities, while there are developmental disabilities, while there are mental disabilities, um, the, the term mental health doesn't adequately convey the types of disabilities and the experience those folks are having. And so when you talk about tokenizing, I think like the term mental health and taking care of your well-being has been completely tokenized because we haven't taken the time to develop societies and infrastructure that are supportive of disabled folks. If we would have done that years ago, decades ago, uh, we wouldn't be seeing, you know, kind of like the, the the mass casualty event that we've seen during the pandemic. We wouldn't see, you know, the, the mass um, influx of, of folks having suicidal ideations and, and depression and things like that. If we had developed the proper infrastructure to take care of disabled folks, which they advocated for, self-advocated for, were very articulate about needing, um, we, we could avoid a lot of, of the hardships that we were experiencing. But society is again, run on a capitalist model, and that's, that's completely selfish, and we just throw the most marginalized folks on, on, on the most extreme margins of society under the bus, and it, I think that go back to our, our main conversation, like, that goes back to media, right? Um, disabled folks are either inspiration stories and turned into inspiration porn, or they're treated um, as, as charity cases that are, are like a petting zoo, right? The, the charity model of disability is well known, and, and, and so when you only have those kinds of narratives being propped up in media, you don't recognize the full humanity of disabled folks and that leads to you know the systemic ableism that's hurting everyone right now it's just kind of a fucked up place yeah this is lydia um so many policies that i'm seeing come out are basically fuck you if you're sick or disabled and we're going to use the language of mental health to fuck over disabled people including those of us with psych disabilities or psychosocial disabilities just it's that's the message that we're getting um Kristen, I'll go back to you. Yeah, I think for me, it's been interesting because up until the pandemic, you know, I had always prided myself on outside of my disability. You know, I was, I'm relatively healthy. You know, I don't have a lot of, of the medical problems that people with my disability have. And then also, I think are unfairly attributed as, you know, disabled people are inherently sickly. You know, so I'd, I'd always kind of prided myself on being incredibly healthy. And once the pandemic started, you know, I became very cognizant of the fact that like, full disclosure, up until a, a week ago was the first time I'd ever gotten a flu shot. I had never been afraid of the flu before in my life because I was like, oh, the flu, I can, I'll be fine with that. And then, I'll, you know, a pandemic comes and I started to think like, well, maybe I wouldn't have been, you know, I, I don't know. Um, and with COVID, a lot of the discussion has been, you know, even from family members of mine who, you know, do not believe in science, um, you know, I think I would be okay if I got sick, but I honestly don't know why would I want to take that chance. So, you know, for me, I've been very cognizant of, you know, my surroundings. When the vaccines came out, you know, my mom and I were first in line, even though I'm highly needle phobic, I got all three jabs and, 
you know, I was completely proud to do it. And now it's just that a part, you know, I, I'm in Los Angeles and, you know, it's, it's essentially, it's over. Some, somehow we've settled on a date where this just ended. Uh, and so, you know, mandates uh, are going away, masks are coming off. You know, I, I go to events, few events uh, for my, my job, you know, and I'm the only one with a mask on the only one who brought a mask, you know, so, so it's very weird that, you know, I, I once again kind of looked at askance, not because of my disability, but because I'm the only person still adhering to these rules that have kept me safe. Um, and I think that the, in, the individual mentality that we have, you know, it's very American, you know, America may be a country that was founded on this concept of freedom, but it's always been about like, us as individuals, you know, what can, what can I do, even if it screws you over, you know, so it's never been about, you know, a common good or banding together, helping your fellow man. It's always been about like, what can I do for myself? And I think that that's ultimately where I'm at. You know, I've, I've made decisions in my life where I'm like, if I'm going to have a birthday party or something, you know, I'm only inviting people that I know are vaccinated and think like I do. And if that means that certain people, including members of my family, can't come, I don't really care. You know, that door swings both ways. And I think that's where some people don't like it is like, well, why am I X'd out because of this? Well, I mean, if we're all saying that it's all about the individual, my health becomes far more paramount than your comfort. You know, so I think I think it's unfortunate that, you know, our, our government, uh, structure has just kind of been like the Titanic, every man for himself. Uh, and it, it is frustrating because it just kind of makes me, it, it comes back to that concept of fairness, which we should not expect in America at all. Um, you know, but I, I did everything right. I, I did my, I got vaccinated. I, I took two years out of my life. I stayed safe as best as I can. What do I have to show for it? Now it's, you know, like a game of Frogger where it's just like, well, you know, you're just going to have to be able to move through life and not, you know, hope you don't get sick. And that should, should not be the mentality that we're at. But, you know, we're a country that I think embraces forced helplessness. So it's where we are. And so it's, for me, it's all about just keeping myself safe, keeping my family safe and, you know, making smart choices that work best for me. Thank you for sharing that, Kristen. And like, I'm finding that frustration too, right? Like I tell people all the time that essential we're witnessing is celebrating a culture of ableism and death. Exactly. Of, you know, how ableism tells us that disabled people are expendable and disposable, especially the disabled people deemed the most quote unquote useless. The disabled people who are the least pretty, the least palatable, the least productive. It's just very eugenicist thinking and it is prevalent in media coverage of disability in public discourse about disability and in the actual social policies that affect our lives. Yeah, it, it'll be interesting, I think, to see as the years go on, you know, we're seeing it now. They're talking about the number of long haul COVID people, you know, trying to apply for social security disability benefits. You know, and I think that that's going to be an interesting discussion to have over the next couple of years, unfortunately, as more people need those resources, you know, as somebody who has been fortunate to be able to get off of SSI, you know, there's this real disturbing belief in this country that the government pays me a living wage to because I'm disabled. Uh, and now, you know, there's a lot of people realizing as they're applying for these benefits being like, wait, I'm supposed to live on $200 a month. How is, how long has this been going on? And it's, you know, I, I tend to sit in the back and just be like, well, you know, this is, this has been the damn world. I've been telling you, you know, for all this time and now, now everybody's experiencing it. So it'll be interesting to see over the next decade, you know, I think that, you know, I'd like to say there might be a reckoning with ableism, but I've been wrong before. <laughs> And, you know, I wish I could say that I hope we would, you know, be wrong and that that would have a chance of being the case, but I'm kind of pessimistic at this point. You know, Dominic, we haven't heard from you, um, if you would weigh in. Sure. Um, so my situation is a, a bit different um, from Kristen's. It's actually kind of the opposite where 
when I was growing up, I actually had pneumonia a lot because my physical disability, part of that comes with respiratory issues. That's like a mainstay of my disability. Um, when people die of my disability, it can be from um, heart issues or respiratory problems. So I am immune compromised. And um, this discussion has been weighing very heavily on my mental health uh, because I, like I said, I am mental or I am uh, multiply disabled. I do have um, mental health based disabilities, um, which have not been very conducive for the pandemic. I know we've spoken about this over the pandemic, Lydia, about how our OCDs have manifested in kind of this uh, this space where, you know, um, as a physically disabled person, people don't value me. They see my body. Um, I'm not considered a pretty disabled person. So I'm dismissed on all these levels. So to hear that the pandemic is over when I've been, um, I just figured it out. It has been two years, two months, and four weeks since I have been outside. I haven't seen the sun. I haven't sat on my deck because my neighbors do not understand social distancing at all. It is not safe for me to go out. And do you know what the response on social media has been? Stay in your house. What do you, what the world should stop for you? You're one person. My children are suffering because of people like you. On and on and on. That's the thing as the as a, a physically disabled person. As someone with psychosocial disabilities, it's been, you know, your mental health doesn't matter. You're basically you're crazy anyway. You're not gonna get better. Just deal with it and get over it. We don't care. That has really been the message that I've received. And I have really, really been suffering because of that to where I feel isolated. I, for the first year I lived in a state of shock, uh, both my girlfriend and I, we couldn't do anything. We struggled to work. We struggled to, we just, I, I feel like some days all we could do was just enough to get out of bed and you know, go through the motions of eating and, and sleeping and things we had to do to survive. So then two years in, it just got to where it was like, no, we have to get back to work. And we've really kind of upped our game in terms of you know media, because the hope is that if we just keep doing our work, eventually people will start giving a damn about disabled people. And maybe it's you know not even, logical, I guess, to expect that. But if we don't have hope, what do we have? You know, my hope is that the work eventually will get there. Eventually, well, people will start caring. Uh, but I don't see it. They don't care. It doesn't affect them. If it doesn't affect them, it doesn't matter. And that's the way the world is. Um, so I guess right now, my only thing is holding on to hope for my own sanity for my own mental health, for my own protection, um, and, and hoping that I can turn to my work. I really have. I, I feel like I'm not really talking to other people right now. I'm just working and working and working to keep myself busy in the hopes that something will change and get better. This is Lydia. I really feel that, right? Like that we are slogging through just having to do what we have to do to survive, to get through our day. And we don't have the time to really be able to sit, lie down, relax, and to just actually rest. And even when we feel like we are resting, we're probably still stressing, right? Like that's been my experience. And just knowing that the work is also the only thing that I can do when faced with constant, overwhelming, and exhausting expectations on me as a disabled person in an ableist society. It's too much. Now, tonight, you know, we are talking about how 
media perceptions of disability affect disabled people's lives and in turn affect and also reflect ableism in society. And so I'm hoping that the two of you can talk a little bit about how media portrayal of disability shapes public perception of disabled people and especially for disabled BIPOC and queer and trans disabled people. Can we start this time? I'm gonna lob it right back at you, Dominic. Yeah, so um, since the hallmark of my work has been the idea that media perceptions influence disability and disability influences media perceptions, I've always seen it as a cyclical problem. We have to address both. We have to get more disabled people in the media, making media being the leaders, but we also have to um, make sure it's done responsibly. I feel like, and, and, and I don't wanna put the onus on disabled people here. When disabled people are in rooms, they are sometimes pressured into doing whatever to get themselves out there, especially disabled actors. I feel like disabled actors have very little freedom to really talk about the problems in Hollywood. It's kind of this, you want to be grateful you got a role. And we see that even with big disabled stars, the few that have really come to the forefront, they they will talk about it to a certain extent, but they have to protect themselves because it's always about, will you get another job? And um, I feel like that's a very big fear in Hollywood that's preventing our forward mobility and seeing perceptions change. The non-disabled people are still controlling the narrative. Look at a film like CODA. CODA just came out. CODA was still made from the perspective of a non-disabled writer telling a story. The lead character is non-disabled. They focus on how disability, um, deafness, how that affects non-disabled people. It's not from the perception or perspective of disability. So even when we're having, you know, these these actors say, hey, I'm playing this role. We're not always seeing it from the perspective of disability. I know that in film school, they talked a lot about the female gaze and the queer gaze. Well, there is this disabled gaze and the disabled gaze when non-disabled people are crafting these narratives, it is not the same way as when disabled people are, because we're coming from a personal perspective of understanding. I often feel like the perspectives of disability we see are what disabled people think disability is like. And where did non-disabled people come from a lot of the time is from a place of fear. I don't want to become disabled. I'm scared of becoming disabled. So that's the narrative we see. And then so a lot of times it's like this negative perception. But if disabled people who actually have experience are crafting these stories, um, it's a totally different thing. Uh, the response to the video I made spaces exemplify that. People constantly have told me the, the inclusion in the video which is, uh, if people don't know what the video is, it was created by a group of us from the SMA community. I have a SMA, which is spinal muscular atrophy. That's my physical disability. And we just wanted to show that we were, were creative, were entertainers. It was meant to be a video. My scope in making this video was from the perception of, this is art not this is art by disabled people, just this is art. We're here, the, the song is called Spaces and the entire part of the music video, the entire message is, we deserve to be in these spaces, we deserve to be in this world. People told me it's effortlessly inclusive because inclusive was just built into the design of it. I'm you know, non-binary and trans and disabled. Um, the people that I wanted included, you know, were not all white. 
not all straight, you know, it, I made sure because, you know, from the start, I knew that this needed to be represented in a way that was authentic. And so I don't think non-disabled creators, um, you know, I don't necessarily think they're setting out to harm us, but I don't think they understand the harm they create when they tell our stories without involving us and when they're the ones crafting them. So I think that really affects perceptions overall. Thank you so much for sharing that. And we're trying to drop all these links in the chat, but please share your links in the chat for everyone who's here so they can check out your work. Um, AJ, I'll turn to you next. Uh, hey, y'all, this is AJ. So this isn't my area of expertise, but I think Dominic made some amazing points. I think of a show like This Close, which is, which was created by, you know, deaf folks, but only got two seasons. Um, I think about um, a show that I kind of like, I know a lot of autistic folks don't like, but atypical, but the actor isn't actually autistic, right? You think about the movie that Brian Cranston did a couple years ago, where he he's a wheelchair user, but obviously Brian Cranston's not disabled. I think it's it's just there's so many different things that Dominic touched on that are so frustrating. And, and I think the harm is, is real and tangible. And I think about, you know, things like Rain Man as an autistic person, right? And how that affects how people view me and my autism. Um, but obviously, you know, I, I'm, I'm black and autistic, which is, which is you know, um, something that, that's not really promoted in the media. I know there was like the, the Power Ranger actor um, in the weird Power Ranger reboot a couple years ago, um, it was a black autistic view, but then they use things like high functioning, right? Like, and you know, that's, it just, it makes you cringe. Um, and, and so I guess, um, I mean, I'm kind of rambling. Can you repeat the question, Lydia? I apologize. You're not rambling. It's great. Um, and I know that for me as an East Asian autistic person, I struggle too with just not seeing any autistic people of color presented prominently in the media that we are offered and no real representation of autistic people of color in most positions of influence. And there are only a handful of autistic people of color, right? That are prominent in media or in politics or in research, right? There's only a handful of autistic people of color who are openly autistic, right? Who are in positions where they have access to resources, they have access to a platform where they are recognized as leaders or thought of as main characters, right? And that to me is one of the most uh, upsetting things about existing in the world as someone who is a person that is described as, oh, you are all of the things or you are too many of the things, right? Like I get that a lot. How can you be all those things? Aren't you just trying to get attention? You're just trying to be really special. And I'm just thinking, I'm trying to live my life. And I would like to be able to live my life knowing that people who are like me, who share experiences like mine, can also be respected and afforded respect and represented in ways that count and in ways that matter and not just in tokenizing ways and not just in the occasional special episode. Arina Amon calls that the very special episode syndrome. Um, you know, I want to see people who are multiply marginalized show up in ways where we're not just expected to be the experts on diversity or we're not just be expected to just make people with more privilege feel better about themselves. So, you know, I, I appreciate you sharing. Yeah, and I just I just also wanted to note, even when there is, you know, disabled product, that's amazing. Like I talked about this close, but something like Crip Camp, like you can critique Crip Camp, you know, for lots of different things, but that is a very beautiful expression of the disability rights and disability justice movement. But then it loses, you know, at, you know, these award shows, which in, in reality don't count, but loses to a documentary about an octopus, right? Like these are the actual lives of our disabled elders and ancestors who were dying for our rights and our freedoms. And it, it loses to a documentary about a random octopus, right? And it's like disabled folks aren't even valued when they're creating beautiful art. And, you know, I'm sorry, you can, you can go, Kristen. Hi, 
Kristen, um, the floor is yours. <laughs> I was going to say thank you to AJ for bringing up my hatred of the octopus. Uh, if, if anybody ever uh, asks me, I usually um, drop the F-bomb in front of the word octopus, uh, just because I'm like, that an octopus bested us again. Uh, so sorry to anybody who liked uh, my, my octopus teacher. Um, I hate it. Uh, <laughs> but other than that, I mean, um, you know, for me in the work that I, I cover, you know, film and television are, are the biggest way that people can learn about other cultures and people that are different from them. You know, media has that power. Um, you know, and I remember growing up and people would hear my disability, e even up to a couple of years ago. I would tell people what my disability was. And the first thing they would say is like, oh, like an unbreakable, like, like Samuel L. Jackson. And that for better and worse shows the power of why it's so vital to see disabled people in film and television. Because for many people who are never going to meet a disabled person in their life, that is it. And so bad depictions foster bad stereotypes. Um, you know, and, and I often get asked, is the industry getting better with disability, what are we still looking at? And a lot of the issues that I write about are still paramount. You know, most disability narratives are about white men, um, usually upwardly mobile, um, uh, affluent, uh, and usually disabled late in life because the belief is that audiences are so dumb or unsophisticated, depending on how you want to look at it, that you know you have to show a disabled person as normal. So that the audience will identify that with them before they're struck down by this horrible thing known as disability. Um, and so, you know, growing up as a disabled teenage girl, you know, who was the only disabled person in her family, only disabled person in her high school, um, you know, when you don't see yourself on TV, you those codes of conduct don't exist. You know, I didn't know what dating looked like for me because I didn't see anybody that looked like me date or go to prom or just do all those things that, you know, people watch at slumber parties and, and you know, kind of have those fantasies of like, oh, you know, this is what prom is going to look like. This is what, you know, turning 18 is going to look like. And if you're disabled, let alone any type of minority and disabled, you don't know what, what filmic depictions look like because you don't exist. Um, and I think that's something that's really hard for a lot of representatives and people in the industry who are trying to at least push the few disabled things that exist in media. You know, I get I get emails all the time from people being like, hey, do you want to interview this person? They they're a disabled actor, they're in this show for one episode, and you know, the representation is important. You should write about it because you're disabled. And I've had to kind of create boundaries and be like, listen, I've written so many articles about white male disabled wheelchair users in TV. I'm sick of it. I, I mean, I need something different. If you have a show where you have a non-binary disabled person or a woman, you know, or a per woman of color, um, and they're in more than one episode, like then we can talk or better yet, what really wow me and give me a show that has a disabled director disabled screenwriter, disabled cinematographer. That's where the needle really needs to move. It's so easy to cast authentically. It's so easy. It's ridiculous that it's not employed more often because it's the easiest way to start. What we really need to see now is more disabled people behind the camera. More importantly, in executive positions at studios because that's the only way things change. So, you know, for me as somebody who is one of the few disabled, physically disabled journalists at a trade level, you know, I think there's this belief that like, well, you're part of the problem, you're not covering everything. And my thing is, is like, no, I'm just not covering the few scraps that, that studios think that they're going to give us. I need to be able as a journalist to write about stuff that's truly changing the landscape and or comment on how things are staying the same and why, why that is. This is Lydia. I hope you get a lot of pitches for articles after this and that your inbox gets flooded with people saying, check out what I'm creating and check out how it is celebrating 
disabled people and disabled people's cultures and disabled people who are not all straight, cis and white. I really hope you get that. And um, I will certainly be in contact with you, right? Because I'm like, I'm already, my wheels are spinning. I've got some ideas. I will be messaging you. Like this will be happening. Please do, please do. I want to turn to talk about some examples of bad media representation. So either journalistic examples like in the media or popular culture or both. Can you each talk about some of the worst representations of disability and how, if at all, disabled activists have been able to challenge those representations? And I'm gonna lob it right back to you, Kristen, to start us off. Lydia, we could be here all day if we're talking about bad depictions of disability in media. There's so many to choose from. I Um, know. (laughs) I mean, thankfully, you know, I, I haven't had examples. I've had examples of other journalists, you know, reaching out to me being like, I'm a non-disabled journalist, but I want to review this, this disabled product. Um, can you read my review and let me know if it's offensive? Um, which is always funny to me because I'm like, well, if you worry that it's offensive, maybe you shouldn't be writing it. Maybe you should be sending it out to another journalist who maybe is disabled that would have a perspective that is not going to get you in trouble. Um, so that's that's always you know, derogatorily funny to me when that happens. Um, you know, somebody asked me about like verbiage, like what is, is it wheelchair bound? Are we still using that? You know, is it disabled or do we say handy capable? I don't know what the terminology is, um, which is hilarious to me that I'm just like, hi, how have you not known in 2022 what words are acceptable to utilize? Um, bad depictions of disability in media, at least. I mean, there's, there's so many, but some of the ones that I, I love, or at least love to make fun of, um, is the concept of people with disabilities being independently wealthy or uh, having a a lot of money is not an issue in media with regards to disability. Um, You know, the great example that I always use is uh, Me Before You, which is the Jojo Moyes adaptation, which I did go see in a theater. I was the only disabled person in physically disabled person in the theater. We all got offered boxes of tissues before the screening, which I knew was probably not going to be a good thing. Um, and, you know, in the movie, the guy, because again, it's a white guy who is disabled late in life doing some like rich guy thing. I think he's like hang gliding or something. He gets run over by a car. I don't know, some rich person problem. Um, but, but he's uh, in a, a wheelchair, he's paralyzed and he lives in a castle. Not kidding, full stop, castle. You know, he's got a whole wing devoted to him. He's got an accessible car. He's got, you know, no problems whatsoever. His only issue other than he's a bitter rich guy is that, you know, he can't have sex. And he's got this hot girl that's like throwing herself at him. And he's like, no, I must go to the Swiss Chateau and kill myself. I'm not kidding. This is all in the movie, Uh, (laughs) which is again, just hilarious. And I think that's the thing that always really makes me frustrated is that there's this idea that disabled people are being taken care of, whether that's by family members or the government, or, you know, there is some type of financial recompense that we are being given as disabled people so that we can live our lives. And a lot of these movies, and the Bryan Cranston movie, The Upside is another example, another movie where the character is presented as incredibly affluent. You know, Coda, for all the valid criticism about it, I think what I appreciated about that movie was that it showed a family that was not ridiculously wealthy. Um, You know, the ABC sitcom Speechless, which is one that I I really loved that I wish it got more attention when it was on, was about a family that was struggling to make ends meet. You know, that's the reality of, of disability is that a lot of the disabled people you know, deal with poverty in different ways. Um, You know, my family struggled with finances. And I think that by presenting disabled people as being rich, it creates, continues to create this concept of like, well, you know, you're asking for special privileges. You're asking for entitlements. You're already entitled. You guys have castles and free money and you get all these things. It's because movies keep illustrating that financial concerns are not our problem. So that's that's always the bad faith 
element of, of media portrayal of disability that always just inflames me. And it just reeks of privilege, right? Like the way that disability as Talila Lewis, T-A-L-I-L-A, Lewis, L-E-W-I-S, has always described it, that we are taught to understand disability through a framework of privilege. That when we talk about disability, the assumption is that we mean white disabled people, wealth privileged disabled people, cis het disabled people, any disabled people who have access to the most privilege rather than disabled people who are at the margins of the margins. Where by the way, disability is actually more prevalent than it is in any privileged community. Last, uh, I will, not last, next I will move to, to AJ if you would talk about some bad, awful, privileged representations of disability and perhaps ways that disabled activists have been able to challenge. Yeah, I think most disabled representations are pretty poor or garbage, ableist. Um, something that I, I, I took small hope and pride in is last summer, maybe it was two summers now, kind of the movement talking about the James Bond villains and villains in general always having facial differences and how that's such a trope that, that makes othering normalized and, and you know feeds into ableism and, and disability phobia where if, if you are different, if you have a physical disability, if you have a facial difference, that automatically means you're evil or you have a villain origin story. And there is a lot of movement around that. We'll see, you know, if, if that actually changes anything, I'm, I'm very pessimistic about it, but that was a, 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 sorry, give me a second. That was an instance of folks saying like, yo, this is fucked up. We've been dealing this with forever. Like, why do you always do this? And it kind of getting into the mainstream, but then you also have that problem where the mainstream kind of co-ops that narrative and you have folks who aren't actually dealing with the repercussions of this um, uh, firsthand um, or, or um, immediately kind of writing the stories and shaping the narrative around that. And so, you know, it's hard to have hope that, you know, whenever the next James Bond film comes out like I, I don't watch those movies um, but whenever that comes out you know is the villain going to have you know some huge scar like you think about the Lion King and Disney and you know you can talk about all the issues with Disney and Lion King and, but the main villain is named Scar right like it, it's it's so in your face it's wild you think about the hunchback of, of Notre Dame right like it's 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 actually wild how insidious this type of shit is and people are just cool with it Right. And, and we, we can talk about reckonings and, you know, it's, it's a privilege to have access to knowledge. I want to say that. But like you, like you can't get away with blackface now. I mean, like you have like a Ralph Northam who did it and still got to be governor. But like you can't do that in a movie now where you can still like pretend like you are, are, are paralyzed in a movie and it's OK. Right. You can pretend to be disabled. You can have non-disabled folks putting on disability as if it's a costume and it's OK. And like it's just so wild to me. And then you have these folks who are like, are you saying non-disabled folks can't play disabled characters? Well, yeah, kind of. But also, as Kristen said, there are tons of disabled folks who are out there who are good, who are doing this art, who have mastered this craft that you can find. Like there, there are people out there. So what are you doing to include them? And so I, I think it's, it's, it's just honestly, it, it's really, really frustrating just thinking about how widespread insidious and institutionalized the ableism is and how a lot of people just don't care and it's like you know whatever get over it en enjoy the movie enjoy the show like at least you have a character right get the fuck out of here yeah to, to piggyback off of that really briefly this is Kristen off of what AJ is, is saying I love that he pointed out the aesthetic element of of media which I think is something that is very under talked about, you know, there's a reason that white males are what we see with disability portrayal because women who are disabled are considered, you know, to use a term that I, I coined when it comes to, to disability, you know, they're, they're unfuckable. You know, nobody's gonna want to, to have sex with a woman who is disabled. And I think that that's the one of many things that it contributes to such body image issues for disabled women, you know, as, as a woman who has struggled with self-esteem 
and body image, you know, when you don't see somebody that looks like you, you know, there's this commonality that like no guy is going to want you because you do not look like you're five, eight and 130 pounds. Uh, you know, what, what you don't have any worth at that point. And I think that that is one thing that just kills me is that there's a, you know, generation of disabled girls growing up that are going to go through the same self-esteem issues that I did because they don't see themselves on TV. Dominic, did you want to add to that? Yes. Uh, so first, um, disability is not something you can act full stop. It's not something you can act. And I, I, I just what that said, uh, disabled mimicry um, is a huge problem. Uh, disabled mimicry being when non-disabled people play disabled roles. But I think there's this misconception that we can act as disabled. And I have to tell you for about 20 years, I've been asking the question, how does one act disability? And I can't, I have yet to have one person who can, they, they can't even answer. You know, there's no logical answer that they can give. If you can't tell me how you can act disabled, you can't do it because it's just not possible. It's, it's kind of like, you know, it's an immutable trait that, that we have that you can't act. So I wanna start there. I wanna go back to a little bit of what Kristen said because she brought up some projects that I've personally been involved with. Um, me before you being the first, uh, I don't know if uh, the people here know that there was an international protest and that I was, um, at the center of it, um, back in the day, it's not that far ago, but back in the day, I was a bit of a rabble rouser on Twitter, and I was heavily involved in Twitter activism. When the disabled community comes together, whether online or in person, we can really make a ruckus, and that was what I set out to do. I was told by people in the UK, they came to me and they said, Dominic, Jojo Moyes is making this film me before you and the message is you are better dead than disabled. I immediately downloaded the book and read it and threw it, you know, threw it metaphorically at my wall several times. It is the worst book I've ever read. And that is saying a lot. Then I in turn read the second novel, which also includes disability. The main character becomes disabled and it's worse than the first one. They had plans to make a second film and we disrupted it and they canceled those plans. The disabled community did this. I led with a with a couple other people, Carrie Ann Lucas was one of them. Um, Carrie Ann Lucas, me, Terry Hartman Squire, um, a bunch of, of, of disabled people in uh, the UK and Australia. We ran an international protest that um, got the Twitter, the Twitter chats with the actors shut down. All I had to ask Sam Clayton was, do you know the harm you're causing disabled people by playing this role? And he said, that's it, we're canceled. We're done, I gotta go, I have plans, I can't do it. We shut down his Twitter chat. You know, that was not the idea, but it really said a lot that that was what happened. You know, instead of, you know, um, addressing this or really, you know, you know, thinking about the fact of what he was doing, the actors just didn't care. So I think when you ask what can disabled people do, the me before you protests, which were in the UK, Australia, and um, here across the US, there were protests in Rochester, Denver, other parts of Colorado, um, I'm pretty sure Canada did some too. Um, Los Angeles, um, I think maybe Seattle, I think Washington DC did some stuff too. There were just protests everywhere. And I don't feel like we've ever had that level of engagement the same way with an international community, but it really showed the potential of what happens when disabled people around the world work together 
to fight a problem because the fact that we got the sequel from being made because of our protests, they said the film just, it did it, it wasn't viable to make a sequel because of, um, and I think that we very largely played a role in that. Um, I also want to briefly address CODA, I uh, because I am a CODA, my dad was deaf. And I'm a CODA. And the one thing I really struggled with with that movie was this idea of, you know, um, being a burden almost on your family. You know, if 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 you are disabled, you know, the it's all about this girl whose family is kind of like this burden or seen as a burden on on her. You know what I mean? And they they showed this scene in a clip where she's they're at this meeting and she has to interpret for her parents because they don't know you know what everybody's saying and all the non-disabled people on twitter were like i feel so bad for her that her family is such a burden on her and i remember just thinking my dad was never a burden on me what he what he was was a guide seeing his, the autism he went through was a reflection of the ableism I went through. Where I remember very clearly being a young person and my dad being kicked out of a church choir because they said he couldn't sing because he was deaf. My dad had a beautiful voice, but he would occasionally hit the wrong note if he couldn't hear the music. And I said, you know, I, I, I don't really talk about my sexuality, or I mean my sexuality, my religion. I don't really talk about my religion that much. At the time, I did believe in God. Um, I have very different views now, but I said, if God exists, what does he care what somebody sings like if somebody's singing and, you know, kind of prays to him, you know? And the minister was like, if it's not beautiful, then God hates it. And I just remember that very clearly being like, you know, th this is horrible. My dad turned away from religion completely because of this instance. And so to see, for me, CODA was a very different experience as a CODA to watch it because um, I don't want consolation crumbs. I don't want the little moments that are okay when I see the other instances of your family's a burden on you. And I and so I think that kind of bad representation, you know, that's what really gets to me. So what am I doing about it? Right now I'm writing scripts. You know, I am making television. That's my, that's where my heart is. That's what I want to do because I want to show stories that have never been told and not just disabled stories you know for me if you want to see examples of bad disability explained read our film disc paper filmdisc.com go to our work research projects we also have easy language versions available because it is a very long paper the paper is meant to be for Hollywood, to say, Hollywood, you're doing this wrong. This is where you're getting it wrong. And this is where you need stuff fixed. But we wanted to also make it available so anybody can read it and understand. So we have an easy listening version. We have a fact sheet. We have it available in PDF and on Google Drive. We tried to make it as accessible to as many people as possible. And um, so, um, if you read through that, um, I just wanted to, before, before I uh, finish uh, this, answering this, uh, is um, tell you a little bit about autistic representation in our last paper. Since, we, uh, since you are the Autistic Women and Non-Binary Network, I think it's really reflective of how bad representation is. Um, so, we broke down our research by disability. We know everything about these characters, the ages that are portrayed, what their genders are, what their gender identities are, what their race is. We can tell you everything about how artistic people are represented by that. Um, 
what we found out of 250 shows is that there were only 15 autistic characters at all. That was one more character than the previous year. And we watched 70 more television shows than the, the previous year's study. So that, that to me was just deplorable. There's not nearly enough representation. You can't have one character represent a whole spectrum of one disability, you know? You can't have one one character be the whole representation for something. And that's what we're seeing. That's why um, I think it can be both difficult and easy to criticize representation, especially for um, disabled categories where we see so little representation like um, autistic representation, little people are not represented that much. Um, uh, in, in television right now, um, and deaf people are not represented in high numbers. So in these communities- Unless it's Marley Matlin. Marley well, Matlin, yeah, well, he's well yeah, represented. That's, and that's really like the one person, right? The one person. Yeah, that's tokenized representation really, you know? So, and then, um, uh, so the autistic category was incredibly white. Um, that's always been the narrative around autism, and it's part of why it's such a struggle for non-white autistic people to get diagnosed in the first place. We see direct correlation with where there is not representation, where there is failure for diagnosis, uh, treatment options uh, for disabilities that, that need them, where uh, access to medical care access to school supports, all of that is directly where we see lack of representation. So there is a connection that we can actually make. Um, and um, the representation, there actually was more female representation than uh, male, um, which is, is rare because usually, um, white heterosexual males are represented. But this time it was cisgender white women of unknown sexuality. That, and I find that really interesting. So there were five cisgender white female characters that weren't allowed to have a sexuality at all. With the second most prosperous group of characters being white heterosexual males, which were three. Um, you know, so like even when women that are white are represented, they don't really get to be sexual beings. I think that goes back to even, you know, what Kristen was saying about, you know, sexuality and representation, really. But yeah, so that's just a, a brief overview. Um, I can also put out, um, there was one LGBTQIA autistic character. And I guess, I mean, I'm pretty sure everybody in this room knows why. That's bullshit. It was the bisexual character, uh, Matilda, played by Kayla Cromer. Um, so um, everything's gonna be okay. She was the only uh, LGBTQIA um, autistic character represented in the year of, of research that we did. And black and brown representation of autistic characters accounted for one cisgender black heterosexual male who was Jewish, one cisgender black male of unknown sexuality, one cisgender black female of unknown sexuality, and one cisgender indigenous or other POC uh, person, female of unknown sexuality. So we're literally having one person from each of these categories represent all autistic black women, all autistic black men, all autistic indigenous and other POC uh, folks. So like, I mean, the research is there. It shows where the representation is, why it's bad and why we're not seeing progress, so. This is Lydia. Thank you for sharing that. I know that we put the link to your study in the chat and we'll make sure to send that out to everyone who is here. Uh, we are very close to wrapping up for the evening. So if you're in the audience, 
and you have a question you want our panelists to address, now is your time to send those questions. As we wait for those to come in, I have a speed round question. Can you answer it in less than 30 seconds each? I know, really hard. We're very verbose people as writers and advocates. Less than 30 seconds each. Who is your favorite person or a couple, no more than a couple, favorite disabled people doing work in media or in public spaces? Kristen, go. Oh, geez, because I was going to say Marley Mountain. <laughs> um, oh, gosh. I mean, I look at my colleagues, Jill Pantosi, who used to write for io9, first disabled editor I ever met. And she gave me some great opportunities and was really, I, I use the term inspiration in the sense that as somebody who had never seen a disabled editor who was a woman, she was, she was it for me. So I have to shout her out. AJ. Yeah, hi y'all, this is AJ. First, I, I, I wanna go back and say Foxia, and that's also a reason I don't have a lot of hope is because you can criticize folks and they can just not give a fuck. Um, I also like Eric Garcia. Um, he's an editor, does journalism. Sarah Luderman's amazing. Um, uh, Haley Moss, who I already mentioned, uh, a ton of folks who don't get the, the recognition that they deserve doing advocacy on the ground uh, and, and really holding it down for disabled folks. And I appreciate all of them. And um, I'm out of, actually out of time. I have to go to another meeting, but thank you all so much. I really appreciate it. And if y'all have any questions for me, please, please feel free to reach out. Thank you, AJ, so much for joining us. And Eric Garcia, who you mentioned, is an autistic person of color who recently published a book called We're Not Broken. And we'll send that out to you all as well. Uh, Dominic. So Leroy Moore and Keith Jones and the Crip Hop crew in, inspire me daily to like just their ideas of what they're creating really inspire me to want to do more. Um, Sins Invalid and that crew, um, Maria Palacios, um, and um, oh, oh God, there's one I'm forgetting. Oh, uh, Maylee Johnson and Chronic Loaf what she's doing for people that are stuck at home and creating community and space and entertainment for them on Twitter through Twitter is amazing. Um, she is a black autistic woman. So check her out. Thank you for that last one. You're going to have to spell that out for us because I'm not sure I caught yeah. that. And I don't know if I know that person and now I want to. M A E L E E Johnson J O H J-O-H-N-S-O-N. Um, I think her name, it's like May J, May mm -hmm. J on Twitter or something like that. Yeah. Great. Um, we also have a bunch of comments in the chat too. Um, folks who are attending tonight mentioned Maria Palacios, uh, fellow polio survivor, Incense Invalid. Um, Leroy Moore got mentioned also in the, in the chat. Keith Jones. Emmy Award winner for soundtrack. Uh, so thank you all for sharing that as well. Um, we did have a couple of, uh, of questions. Um, we don't have time for a lot, but in case either of you have a response, we had a question from Timotheus, T-I-M-O-T-H-E-U-S, who asked, do you know of any love stories or subplots that are centered on Black, disabled, deaf, autistic, or neurodivergent folks? And Beth asked, do you have any thoughts about the Amazon Prime show as we see it that has three autistic actors? And if you have any very, very quick comments about either of those questions, either of you. Yeah, um, I, I can't speak to the first question because unfortunately again uh people of color who are disabled tend to be very marginalized at least from a film perspective but i'm sure some something out there has to exist i say that with hope um as far as as we see it i did the review of that for indiewire and it was one of those moments where i didn't necessarily want to review it because in my job uh, i don't want to speak for every disability i don't have every disability but um I was compelled, was told, lovingly told to. Um, so I did, and I talked, reached out to a lot of autistic journalists and asked them, you know, I feel this show is offensive. 
am I wrong? And they were also watching it as well. And they all said, no, you're not wrong. You know, you're on the right track. You know, you, and my, my privilege at a trade, I felt like I had to talk about the issues that I had with that show, uh, which you can Google the review and, and find it there. But I was really surprised by how many um, non-autistic critics uh, championed it and loved it and thought it was such a progressive step forward. Um, and, you know, meanwhile, I was writing about like, yeah, but can we talk about how, you know, the autistic woman who wants to, you know, be a sexual being does have sex and her non-autistic brother, you know, forces, uh, you know, plan B down her throat. Like, I feel like we should be talking about that. Um, so yeah, I do not, uh, I do not like that show. I thought that it was not, uh, not a good step forward. Um, you know, but when you have caretaker cinema, where it's about a show created by somebody who has cared for autistic people, um, as Jason Katims has, you know, you, you're getting what you pay for. Thanks for sharing that. Hadn't heard of it, hadn't seen it, probably not going to watch it. Um, Dominic, any quick comments? Yeah, um, can you repeat the first question? I'm sorry, I, I focused out and missed part of it. Sure. It's of ADHD. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm a big mess of ADHD here too, so <laughs> I understand. <laughs> uh, Timotheus asked, do you know of any love stories or subplots centered on Black, disabled, deaf, autistic, or neurodivergent folks? I have some in my um, portfolio that we at once had develop. And um, I, I will say that we feel very strongly about having writer rooms that are non-white, especially when our, our um, stories are, are about non-white characters, which, you know, we feel very strongly about showing because they are not represented um, so as a white creator, I don't want to be the voice of that, but we do have stories, but no, there are not stories, sadly, that I'm seeing, except for um, occasionally, every once in a great while, you'll catch one from a Black person that's a creator who happens to be disabled. Avery DuVernay's show Queen Sugar, only example I can think is the story of Aunt Vi and um, um, I'm totally blanking on names. Um, her boyfriend and her, no, her boyfriend, um, what is his name? I'm totally blanking. Um, I do this whenever I have to come up with a name. I just, I go, but anyway, their story is so beautiful. She has a chronic disability. She has lupus, which Ava DuVernay has. This is an authentic portrayal of representation from a creator who has this disability. And she's been able to make this character very well-rounded because it's not focused solely on her disability, but her, um, I wanna keep saying his name is Hollywood and that's not it. It's um, La Lafayette, is it? No, not Lafayette. I'm mixing up all my shows. I watch so much TV. I don't think y'all, um, know that Ashton and I do the study alone. We watched 250 shows last year alone between ourselves. So I mix up um, names. That's why I have meticulous research records for the study. But um, yeah, that's the only one I can think for the other question. Um, I don't remember what that question is. I'm sorry. I know we're running out of time. I don't want to take up too much time. So um, this is Lydia. The other question was about the specific show and Kristen, I think, addressed it pretty well. There's yeah, I, I haven't on. seen it yet. We're about a year behind mm -hmm. because of our research. So right. we watched for the year before. Um, I'm pretty sure this show is on my list. Ashton and I break up a list and I can tell you I'm a, I've been dreading it because oh, of the, yeah, because of it. So I'm sure in the next paper, you will see my thoughts on this show. So I guess uh, keep an eye on my work and I will try to mention it on social media when I think when I get a chance, so. Thank you. And just shouting out a couple of the other names um, in the chat for folks to look up and look into, um, Carly Findlay in Australia, uh, Squirmy and Grubs. Uh, I assume that's the name of a show. Um, I don't know it, but thank you for sharing it. And. Uh, a lot of other conversation about that as we see it, uh, a show. 
So thank you again to all of our guests this evening, Kristen, Dominic, and AJ, and also to our access team members, Jessica, Jennifer, and Katie, and to AWN's team, Nancy, and Kate, and Kaylee, for their work and helping put together this evening's program. Our next installment in the Liberating Webinar series will be on March 27th addressing food justice, health justice, disability justice, and prison abolition. So stay tuned for further announcements about the next program, and we hope to see you then. Have a fantastic night.